Ever been told you're not a good listener? <laughs> One of my problems in school was following instructions. I wasn't really paying attention when instructions were given, and I wasn't really good at reading instructions on a page. Anybody else have that problem? Okay, lots of people. What do you think the outcome of that was? A lot of missed assignments, a lot of poorly completed assignments, a lot of stupid mistakes on tests. And time and time again, the teacher's report to my parents was, he doesn't follow instructions well because he's not paying attention. Now, the funny thing is with not paying attention, it's not completely the same as rebellion or willful disobedience, but in the end, it has the same consequences. With rebellion or willful disobedience, something has been stated very clearly, very specifically, and you have just chosen to reject the command and do it your way, sort of like Adam in the Garden of Eden, right? God said to Adam, don't eat of this tree. Adam had it down. He understood the instructions clearly. He knew the tree. He had memorized the instructions. Nevertheless, he deliberately chose to violate them and eat of that tree. That's often not what you're doing when you're not paying attention. It, it's, it's more, when you're not paying attention, it's more like, um, there's some tree I'm not supposed to eat of, and I wasn't really paying attention. My ADD kicked in when God was telling me about it, so I'm not really sure. I'm going to have to text a friend to see what the assignment was. Hey, I'll just ask the snake over here. He seems to be paying attention. He can tell me. Even though it's not deliberate disobedience, it leads to the same thing, doesn't it? And that's me, not paying attention. And that was disobedience for me because my parents had always told me, and my teachers always told me, you need to sit up and pay attention. So the fact that I wasn't, that was disobedience, and it was exposed by the fact that I didn't know any of my assignments. So this is my life, and it still is the same today. It still continues to go on. I go to Ikea, and I buy a little wooden tool, and as you know, all furniture from Ikea is some assembly required, and I look at the little stool, and I think, this is so easy. I'm just going to put this together in five minutes while I sit here and watch this game of basketball and TV. Instructions, <laughs> who needs those? You know, I had to take that stool apart three times. <laughs> Lo and behold, oh, that's not the right piece there. Oh, that's the wrong bolt. Not paying attention, not following instructions, driving down Chancellor's Run Road, red and blue lights going off behind me. I wasn't intending to speed. I wasn't paying attention to how fast I'm going. You know the rate's no different. When you tell, when you tell the officer, you know, I wasn't intending to speed, he doesn't say, oh, that's so different. <laughs> Intentional speeding's a $100 fine. Unintentional speeding, that's only a $20 fine. No, it's the same. 1 Samuel chapter 4, something has changed in Israel. Do you remember what changed from last week? Actually, it was two weeks ago. Maybe you didn't pay attention. You won't remember this. But what changed in the end of chapter 3? <coughs> three times, it says, from 19 to 21, something has happened in Israel. What was that? The word of the Lord had returned to Israel, had returned to Shiloh. Samuel is a prophet, and God is now speaking again to the nation of Israel through Samuel. But the, 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 the thing is, is the people aren't used to this. It's been a while since they had heard or listened to the word of God, and they're not so good at paying close attention. So they always had the instructions in the law. Uh, they, 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 they would have them there in the temple, but that required somebody to read them and explain them to people. It's not like everybody had a copy of the Law of Moses in their home. We talked about this before. They were kept in scrolls, and they, they weren't readily available. You know, you have more access to the Word of God than the nation of Israel did back then. I was reading a, a verse to a fellow this week, and he said, just a second. He pulled out his, his phone, and he punched it up, and he said, all right, I'll follow along with you. And that was really cool, right? He had it right there. Everybody has on their smartphone. Who's got one right now? Somebody hold up their smartphone. See right here. Sarah's got one right there. Look, dude, Rick's got his right there, right? Right there on your, your word of God. Oh, look, there they all are. Everybody's got them, right? That is so cool. I used to carry New Testaments around in my, in my coat pockets or in my car in case I had a 
hospital visit, I had a word of God with me, but now everybody has it all day long with you. That wasn't the case for the nation of Israel. They had to get somebody at the temple to read it to them, and uh, they had to know it. But you have it all the time. It's not really a problem of knowing it. It's the problem of what? Reading it and doing it once you get it, right? So the nation has the laws, and they have God speaking through Samuel. According to verse number 20 of chapter 3, all of Israel knew that the word of the Lord was with Samuel, and he was now a prophet. But are they going to now listen now that they have it? You know, when you really see if someone's paying attention to God or not, do you know how you can tell if someone's really paying attention to God or not? Are they winning the battles or are they losing the battles? Are they winning the battles or are they losing the battles? We are all in a spiritual battle, whether you realize it or not. People who are paying attention and are suited up in the armor of God and are praying for the victory are winning. 1 John 4, 5, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. But lots of folks are losing the battles because half the time they don't even know that they are in a battle until they are knocked down on their rear ends. People don't even know that they're in a spiritual battle until their lives and their homes are being destroyed. And then, only because there's so much pain in their lives and they can't take it anymore, then they will finally start paying attention and recognize what is going on. It is in a time of crisis or in a time of pain, a time of desperation, when they will cry out. And when you cry out to God, when you cry out to Jesus, praise the Lord, he will help you, amen? He will send someone to give you the victory, to explain faith to you, to show you his plan, how to overcome, how the victory is won because it hurts, then you will be willing to listen. Because it hurts, you will make the change, and you will let go and let God have his way. The people who are willing to let go and let God have his way are the ones winning the battles. So let me give you a word of advice. If you're losing your battles, if the enemy is destroying your family and destroying your reputation and destroying your joy, destroying your peace, destroying your life, if you're losing the battles, chances are you're not listening you're not following God's instruction. You're doing life wrong and suffering the consequences of your disobedience. Verses 1 and 2, it says here that the Israel went out to meet the Philistines to battle. They were at Ebenezer, and the Philistines were at Aphek, and the Philistines drew a battle array to meet Israel. When the battle spread, Israel whipped up on the Philistines. No, wait, what does it say? Israel was defeated before the Philistines, and 4,000 men were killed on the battlefield. The nation has gone out to the Philistines to fight them. Let's learn about the Philistines a little bit this morning, a little bit of background or history. The Egyptians called the Philistines the Sea People, the Sea People, because they were from this area right in here originally. They come from the Aegean Sea. This is the island of Crete in the Mediterranean Ocean, and this is the uh, Isles of Greece. And they had migrated at, down into this area. This is Egypt down here, of course. The nation of Israel will be right in this area. And they had migrated and they had set up colonies in that area. Not really sure what prompted these people to kind of move out of this area, down into this area. But they had been in the land for a while. It says in Genesis 21, 34, Abraham had stayed in the land of the Philistines many days. So Abraham, of course, was the father of the nation of Israel. And that puts them in the land around 1900 B.C. The Philistines were very forceful, very aggressive people. They liked to fight. Uh, it says here in, uh, in um, here's a map right here I want to show you. Uh, this is their land right in here. And this is Egypt here. And then this is the promised land where the Israelites lived. Of course, here's Jerusalem. So they're right on their border. And it tells us in Exodus 13, verse 17, when Moses led the nation of Israel out of Egypt and to take them into the promised land, that uh, the Lord knew that the nation of Israel was not ready to face these guys. And it said that uh, when the king to pass Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although it was near. God said, lest perhaps these people change their mind when they see war and turn, return to Egypt. So give me the map again. Instead of taking them the shorter route, which would have been from this area uh, directly into the land, 
God sent them. Send me, send me the two slides back there real quick. There, rest of the way. Yeah, instead of going this way directly into the land, God led and, and uh, Moses led them all down around here for 40 years and then up into the land this way because they were just too rough. And God said, these little slave people are not going to be able to handle going directly through the Philistines' land. You can't hit them right away. And the Philistines were so powerful that they actually challenged the Egyptians. And even though Egypt was very established and very powerful, they had to fight very hard to keep the Philistines from advancing. The Philistine power, give me that other map now, was based in five major cities here in Ashdod, Ashkelon, Ekron, Gath, and you can see that's all right on Israel's border, and then, of course, Gaza. Now, I'm sure you recognize one of the names of these cities. Which one do you recognize? Gaza, that's right. We're always hearing about Gaza because Gaza Strip today is a Palestinian stronghold from which many terrorists still attack Israel even today. So even though the events of Samuel are 3,000 years old, the same stuff is going on today, which really makes us understand that this is so much more than a political issue or a land issue. This is a spiritual battle then as it is today. The same spiritual forces that are warring against God's chosen people 3,000 years ago are still trying to destroy God's chosen people and still trying to destroy God's purposes for the nation of Israel. These five cities were ruled by five warlords, who would all work together to make decisions and to uh, work in unity and fight in unity. A key to the Philistines' dominance in warfare was that they were more advanced as a material culture. The Israelites and the Canaanites were uh, still in the Bronze Age, practicing the Bronze Age uh, uh, skills. Meanwhile, the Philistines had advanced into the Iron Age culture, which made them really invincible in battle and in war. If anybody watches the... uh, the uh, greatest warrior of that show that sometimes on History Channel, when they pit one warrior against another, usually it's the weaponry that makes the difference. And we learn in, later on in a passage in 1 Samuel chapter 13 that the nation of Israel did not have even any blacksmiths to make any equipment. They were so depleted, it says in verse 19, that there wasn't any blacksmiths in all the land. The Philistines just kind of wiped them all out and wouldn't let them have them, said, unless they make what? Swords or spears. So the Israelites, when they went up to fight the Philistines later on, we're going to learn they were using plow points and axes and sickles. Uh, It was expensive to sharpen these things, to sharpen a pitchfork or a goad. On the day they went to battle, Saul and Jonathan had a sword or spear. Not a soldier had a sword or spear. Only Saul and Jonathan had a sword. And everybody else was using some farm equipment. That's what they were using, just something out of the garage. Here, I got a spade, you know, and they're going out to fight with that. Well, meanwhile, the, uh, the, the Philistines had all this body armor, had all this equipment. We saw this in the book of Judges. Likewise, when Samson was fighting the Philistines, what did he have? He just grabbed the jawbone of a donkey off the ground and said, I'm ready, bring it, right? That's what he had as a battle. He used his bare hands. And then we see later on, and we're going to see this in chapter 17, uh, young David, When he goes up against the giant Philistine Goliath, Goliath had all this body armor. He had so much armor, he had a shield bearer who would carry a shield for him. He had all this equipment, the javelin and the swords, and David had what? He had a homemade sling, and as he was going out to battle, he picked up some stones off the ground on his way out. You know, how's that for preparation? You know, he's, oh, let me get my stuff. Okay, we're ready, you know. Just like Samson, oh, here's a jawbone. I'll take at you with that. That's what he had to work with. We'll get into that story more. That's chapter 17. Sometime in the next decade, we'll get to chapter 17. But David understood something. He's going up to face this nine-foot warrior. He understands this is not a physical battle. He said, I don't need all the armor because I'm not fighting a physical battle. Goliath didn't understand that. He laughed at David's sides. He laughed at his sling and his stones. He cursed David and he cursed David's God. But that didn't make David back down, did he? What did David say? 1 Samuel chapter 17, 45. You come at me with the sword and a spear and a shield. 
you know what? It's pretty big, it's pretty impressive, and it's certainly much more powerful than my little sling and my little stones. But you don't understand. I ain't coming at you with a sling and a stone. I'm coming at you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. And can't you hear David? If he's going out there to battle, he's saying, Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? Walks right up to that Goliath, that giant. And if our God is with us, what can stand? Amen? You're not in a physical battle today. It's not a physical battle. You don't need more money or more time or a better education or a better job or a better lawyer or a better doctor. You have to realize you're in a spiritual battle and claim the victory by faith in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. And what is that name? Philippians chapter 9. Therefore, God has given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, of things of earth, and things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Spiritual battles are won in his great name. 1 Samuel chapter 4. Israel is going out to fight the Philistines, and the Philistines with all their equipment and all their skill and their five-city alliance, they put it to Israel, and they pummeled them real bad. It tells us in verse number two that 4,000 Israelites lost their lives. And the people understand something about this loss, don't they? In verse three, what did they say happened? They said, well, these guys had all this better equipment and they were better fighters. Why did they say they lost? The elders of Israel said, why has the... The Lord defeated us. It wasn't the Philistines. It was the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines. The people understand. God wasn't with us. That's why we lost. I wonder why. I wonder why. I think that's the right question, isn't it? The problem is, is they're not asking the right person, are they? All of Israel knows, according to chapter 3, verse 20, that Samuel is the guy that God is speaking to. Chapter 4, did they go talk to Samuel? Did they go ask Samuel what to do? Why, what, did they ask Samuel, why is God defeating us? No, they didn't. Instead, they said what? They said, here's what we got to do. Let's go and get the Ark of the Covenant. Verse number 4, the Ark of the Covenant of God of the host sits on the cherub. I said, that's what we're going to do. We'll get the ark of the Lord that it may come among us and deliver us from the power of the enemy. Did you catch that? Let's bring the ark that it may deliver us. The ark is going to deliver them. The ark is now God. They've turned it into an idol, haven't they? The ark's got power. No. What they're thinking is, is the ark. But it's not the ark. People do this all the time, don't they? They say, I'll hang a cross on my wall in my home or around my neck or I'll light some candles or I'll carry my Bible around and then God will bless me. Is that how it works? How about do what God says in the Bible, right? This is, this is cla folks, this is classic not paying attention. This is classic not following instructions. See, I'm an expert at this, so I can diagnose this stuff a mile away. God never said, take the ark into battle and then the ark will save you. He did say, when he made the covenant with his people in Exodus 23, he said, what's that word? Do all that I speak and I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. If you do all that I speak, Exodus 19, Therefore, if you will indeed carry my covenant, no, no, obey my voice and keep my covenant, not carry the Ark of the Covenant, keep my covenant, then you will have a special treasure to me above all people and the earth is mine. You shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Walking around with the Ark of the Covenant is not the same as obeying the covenant. They're really not paying attention. Furthermore, to add insult to injury, look at who brings it out. Who's the guys carrying this out there? The sons of Eli 
And if you know, you've been with us through this study, the sons of Eli are also called the sons of wickedness. The sons of the devil, weren't they? Because of their wickedness, they don't know God, and here they are bringing the Ark of the Covenant out. Yeah. Word of advice. If you want to know what God wants, don't listen to people who don't know who God is. <laughs> Just uh, saying, right? If you want to know what God wants, don't listen to people who don't know his word and don't follow his word. Don't follow people who are doing the complete opposite of what God is saying. Everybody knows how hypocritical and sacrilegious Eli's sons were. Should have been obvious to everyone that God's not going to go anywhere with these two clowns. That God is going to do anything for these fellas. You know, there's a lot of people who can say the word of the Lord and sound like they know what they're talking about. And they can even have positions or titles that sound very spiritual. You can be an elder or a deacon or a pastor or a reverend or a priest or a bishop or an illustrious potentate. None of that matters. None of that matters. It's what you do with what God has said. We've got people all over the place in our culture who are claiming to know what's right. They're claiming to know what is moral. They're claiming to know what is good based on what they feel, what they've experienced, what their preferences are. Everyone claims they know what is right and what is good. But just because people say it's good doesn't mean it is good. What does God say? What does God say? This week, a professional basketball player came out of the closet. And all the sportscasters said, oh, that's so good. <laughs> He's so brave. That's your definition of good? That's not God's definition of good. We should be listening to nobody else's definition on what is right or good except the God of righteousness, the God of goodness who dwells in inapproachable light and no darkness is found within him. And it doesn't matter if everyone in the whole world thinks something is right or the government makes a law decreeing something is right. If God's word is, is saying it's wrong, if it's contrary to God's word, then it's not right. All the people think that this is a good idea. Everyone agrees, get the ark and God will bless this. And the sons of Eli with their little titles bring it on out there here they're the sons of the high priest of the god of israel they're the high priest sons that'll work how'd it work it says in verse number five they all came with this great shout and they verse 10 they went out and fought and they beat everybody up no israel was defeated and every man fled and the slaughter was very great and there fell of israel 30,000 foot soldiers. And the ark of the Lord was taken. And the sons of Eli, Ophni and Phinehas, Phine they what? They died. Now these guys, God, we know from our previous study that God definitely wanted to punish these two guys because they were wicked, because of their deliberate disobedience. But what's sad here is there's 34,000 Israelites who lost their lives in these battles. And they probably weren't all that bad, were they? Probably they were young fellows who didn't know any better. They didn't know one way or the other what God had said. They were just following orders. They were fighting for their country. They were fighting for their people. They assumed they were fighting for God when the Ark of the Covenant showed up. Hey, God's with us. But he wasn't. And they didn't even know it because they weren't really paying attention. They didn't know the laws of God. But the consequences for unintentional disobedience was the same as intentional disobedience. The same fate that Hophni and Phinehas suffered was the same fate that these 34,000 young fellows suffered. This is a tough message. This is not a real happy, warm, and fuzzy teaching here, but this is something we all need to understand. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, judgment. And all who die in their sin, the wrath of God abides upon them. And it doesn't matter if it was intentional disobedience or just plain ignorance. It's the same consequences. You don't get to plead ignorance. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. I, you know, I never really understood the Bible. I found it kind of hard to read. You know, church was kind of boring and I really couldn't pay attention. I wasn't raised that way. 
Those 34,000 boys did not need to die in that battle if the nation would have went to Samuel and asked Samuel, what does God want us to do? God would have spoke through Samuel and God would have told them they just couldn't be bothered to go ask. This may be painful, but maybe it'll get the nation's attention. And maybe they'll recognize that if they want God's help, they actually need to listen to what God is saying. You see, I know I need God's help to overcome the world and the flesh and the devil. And in order for us to have the victory, Faith Bible Church, we need God. We need God. Which means what? We need to listen and pay attention and follow his instruction. So here they are. When are you going to start? Want the victory? Follow the instruction. Father, we just pray that you will speak to our hearts, that you will help us to understand. Show us where we're being disobedient. Show us where we're not paying attention. Lord, grab our attention. Shake us through the pain and the hurt that we're going through, Lord, through our land and our culture when people are falling away from you and ignoring your word and rejecting your word. Lord, may the pain and the hurt and the failure wake folks up to realize it doesn't have to be this way. Where am I wrong? Help me to get into the word and understand. Lord, help us to be desperate for you, we pray in Jesus' name. Oh, thank you, Pastor.